is it possible? Because I'm like very anti captivity. I'm anti. I I was doing a little bit of research, and it was really infuriating because most of the stuff that was coming up was like pro marine parks, pro zoo, and it was like the benefits of captivity. These animals um, live longer, healthier lives, and you're like you know that's not true you absolutely know that's not true like they're like you said they're not reading they're not using their instincts right they're not using they're not hunting they're not going to top they're all drugged they're all drugged they're all drugged they're all drugged oh my gosh so you're like you know that's not that's not the case um hi everybody you're listening to chatting with candace i'm your host candace horbeck Before we get started on this week's episode, if you want to support the podcast, you can go to chattingwithcandice.com. From there, you can either sign up for our Patreon account where you get early access to episodes and shout outs, or you can click that little link that says buy me coffee. Both things help me out a ton because I'm just getting started with podcasting. This week, I'm really excited to have Phil Demers joining the podcast. Phil has been devoting a lot of his time to saving his walrus, Smooshy. And if you haven't seen the documentary, The Walrus and the Whistleblower, I highly recommend it. I watched it on Amazon Prime. So I hope that you enjoy this conversation. Give Phil a follow and uh, let's get into it. Keep tell- People keep saying, you've got to launch a podcast, Phil. You've got to launch a podcast. And my excuse is I need fancy equipment. As you start small, that's kind of what I've been doing is like you start with like small little purchases and then just like keep tweaking. I don't think it's ever done. Uh, fair enough. That's a good point. I mean, I go live on Instagram and then I feel like if I've got 25 people, <clears throat> I feel like a rock star. So that's my, that I'm already off to a good start. Well, honestly, I think it's like the quality of your follower too, right? Like your followers like are really invested in your story and updates and they're like with with you on that. And then with me, it's like a mix. Like I get some people that want more and then I get other people that are just like, if it's not like a, a sexy photo, they're like, I don't want anything to do with it. So. Right. Mm-hmm. I did a, I did an interesting, <clears throat> because I've always got music in the background, but my music is sort of dated, if you will. So I, I was sort of interested to see what the demographic of the people that are, that are interacting with me live are. And sure shit, I, I was shocked. It was like 30 plus year olds to into like 45 year olds. And they all knew their awesome, like raw punk music. And I'm, I, my jaw hits the floor. I'm like, okay. So whereas I just immediately assumed it'd be kids coming in with a, you know, they're to poke me or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, no, no, these are like intelligible, intelligent people. And I'm having like some pretty amazing interactions with them. It goes pretty deep too. So I'm blessed with uh, the, the demographic of the people that follow and support me are like fucking awesome. I can't say anything other than that. You know, like I, I, I rarely, uh, I, I'm I'm rarely tested by the the dickhead side of things, you know. Like, <clears throat> do you get that? Do you get people that just troll you? Oh shit, yeah, I do. But it, more than not, it's vegans. If you can imagine, oh it's vegans, gosh. or at least initially, it was just people. You know, there is just an element of kill the messenger that just comes with any message. It doesn't matter. It's just by virtue of being a messenger. So there'll always be like a percentage of people that just find you to be. I don't know. I don't know if it's a threat or whatever, or if they're just really bored. I also think that society is collectively uh, uh, <clears throat> are suffering from a, a level of of fundamental mental illness. I think we all have a base level of mental illness that gut that's gone up as a collective whole. So, you know, the the initial reaction to anybody being introduced to either be it a new idea, a new person, sometimes it's threatening. So we're all sort of, no one's immune, right? Well, I thought that was really interesting how, so I watched your documentary and I'm like one of those people, I like feel like it like hurts my heart when I see things like that. Like I'm probably cried five different times and I'm like, oh my gosh, like I can't believe that there's not more happening. But you had mentioned that you had people coming after you for two things. Um, One was like the steak scene. And then two was the, was the beta fish. And you're like, if you watched this documentary and that's what you took away, then you kind of missed the point. And I couldn't agree more. It's like you, you're you almost expected to be like perfect and not human, right? And the thing that's uh, that bothers me the most is just by virtue of having a name and a face attributed to being in a public persona or pu- public space. Now it's expected that I have this level of be it ethics or something that is determined by everyone else is just not enough. It's like, well, I did something. That's why I'm here. Not because I'm not doing enough. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, 
being observed now by virtue of not having done enough, I did something and, and now it's not enough. What a strange thing to, to, to that the, the path to ascension in, in, in the third perspective is always, is never, is never far enough. And, you know, the, the, the big thing is everyone should just be sort of doing a little bit. If everyone did a little bit, we could all just sort of elevate everything. And it seems there's just more a, a prevalence of attacking those who are trying than, than at least initially until people get through that crust, right? Yeah, it's like, well, what have you done to save anyone besides yourself, right? I love that line. What the hell have you done? At least I'm trying. <laughs> At least you're trying. Jesus. And I don't know, um, did you ever watch Chef's Table when that like no. was like having its moment? So there I think it was season one. Um, I hope that it was season one, but they introduced this Buddhist butcher. And that seems like an oxymoron to people. And they're like, well, how can you be a, a Buddhist butcher? Because, you know, most of the Buddhists tend to be like vegan or vegetarian. And his body didn't do well on that diet. Like his body needed meat to like to thrive essentially. Like he, you know, was having issues with energy and all sorts of things. So he took it upon himself to create like a really small farm where like all the animals were turned out and grass, um, grass fed and had access to Rome. And then when it came to the butchering process, like it was very intimate. So like they had um, one animal at a time. It wasn't like factory farming where you have like the long corral full of right. cows that are stressed and like freaking out because they know what's about to happen. So it's one and they take a moment to kind of do like a prayer and like a gratitude moment and like, thank you for the sacrifice you're making. We appreciate it. We're going to use nose to tail. So nothing is going to go to waste. And it's like a very quick, painless death for the animal. So it's like it looks at, I guess, like the issue coming from a vegan's perspective and takes it like to a more applicable way. Like people need to eat meat, right? Like most people eat meat and this is an ethical way to do it. And this is a way that like respects the animal. So to think unless you are only eating soybeans, you can do no good in this world. There's like a that that range is is very vast. And there's think also a large argument that that soy farming is uh, just a destructive in its pesticide use, in its cultivation, in its uh, in, in its taking away from otherwise uh, natural habitats from animals. I mean, look, there's hypocrisy in absolutely everything. It just mm -hmm. becomes a level of which you're comfortable of uh, living with yourself within it. So uh, a lot of people <clears throat> criticize me for my consumption of meat, but no one has yet to make the compelling enough argument, not argument case for me that my body's ever responded to anything like it does red meat and i don't want to be a spokesperson for it but in my experience i've ex i've had uh emotional regulation i've had uh i mean just even physically i mean i'm not gonna rip my shirt off but <laughs> if i were to you would say hello what like because because this time years ago that wasn't the case right mm -hmm. uh, i just my experience is just such that uh, my body works well with red meat. Mm -hmm. So until that, that case, a case gets made that I can find a way to either, you know, even move just sideways and be happy with elevate in some capacity, be it whatever it is that replaces it. I'm in, mm -hmm. right. I'm in. Totally. I couldn't agree more. And it's, it's such an individual basis, right? So some people, they do really well on like a vegetarian or vegan diet and other people, like it's just not, it's not practical. So I think you can't, you can't just search for the flaws, right? Like you have to look at the bigger picture of what people are doing. And you've been on this mission, if you will, for quite a while, right? Like it's been like 20 years. Like this is your journey. Years, wow. <laughs> well, sure. You're, your I journey. have a 20 year journey since starting. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I'm entering 20, 21 years since my, my start of the, my employment at Marine Line, which would be the start date of my journey for sure. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you need to look at the bigger picture, right? So how, so you started as like a young man, right? And for me, like when I was little and I went to, cause I lived in California when I was younger, um, SeaWorld, and I was like, this is the most magical place on earth and I want to be a trainer when I get older. Um, that back then we, you could pay extra and now like after all of these documentaries and stuff come out, you're like, holy shit, this is crazy. But you could pay extra and after the show, you could actually go in the tank with Shamu. So, I must have been like five or six or something. And my mom thought she was being the best mom in the world and paying for this extra thing. And I literally put her baby in a tank with Shamu. So now you see these oh. documentaries of these, you know, these captive animals that 
kind of break, right? Con- because of their their living situation. You're like, that's the most dangerous thing that you could have done. And they knew that going in. Um, but there is like an al- there was an allure back then because there wasn't a lot of voices coming out and there wasn't a lot of footage. So you probably went in and you were like, this is such a cool experience. Like not a lot of people get to be so close to these amazing animals. So how did you go from that and then having like a shift and saying, wait, wait a second, nothing is really making sense here. So it should be noted, I, I started my job at uh, in, in 2000. <clears throat> I would have been 22 years old. I'm from a small town like uh, Welland, which is in the Niagara region, which even if you put the entirety of the region, it doesn't even compare to anything like California. In fact, all of our province doesn't. So I, I'm from a very small place, but be it because it's Niagara Falls, in the summer, a lot of tourism, like millions of people will will descend onto Niagara. So that's what made uh, Marine Land such a, a big success. So the opportunity to be working in this environment in a small town is kind of super unique, right? But it wasn't something I aspired to do. I just sort of, uh, you know, my education was in music and, uh, and at the time what was called uh, uh, multimedia production, which is I mean, forget about it. That's a dated term, but nonetheless, I, I could do some music production and whatnot. So Marine Line sort of liked my, and the only reason I applied was when I was, when I was trying to figure out what it is that I wanted to do and make sense of it, you know, working in audio engineering in the big city and the big, the biggest city near us was Toronto. And that was an hour and a half drive rent on a full, on a full-time basis and, and living in Toronto. I just couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't find the opportunity. So suddenly I, there was, there was this, you know, this ad in the paper to, to work with marine mammals. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. I had no ethical qualms at the time. Uh, this was a celebrated industry. In fact, I, I assumed going in that uh, there were things I would probably like or not, but I, I had no real expectations. Again, it wasn't like a big, long, lifelong dream for me. Although, you know, as a kid, I do remember going to, to marine land, of course, and had positive memories. My first memory is, uh, uh, recollection, of course, is showing up on my first day. There was a lot of people. They seemed to be competent professional people okay i'm in good hands and as soon as you took a look at the uh the environment itself and the animals you're like yeah yeah this is uh it's significantly more substandard than i would have expected mm-hmm. but because i'm a 22 year old kid on day one of my job i'm not gonna open my mouth i don't know anything about these animals i haven't uh, any degree any relevant degree in, in a biology or the care of these animals i have no experience what the hell do i know so you know you keep that what the hell do you know mindset going into anything new um, and you know, my, my very first day I was on my hands and knees actually scrubbing orca blood off an arcade floor. If you can sort of wrap your mind around that, it's kind of a, uh, I mean, if you look at it, it's kind of a powerful notion, an arcade floor with orca blood on it, but yeah, wow. you know, only, di- only days before an animal had, pa- an orca had passed away and they performed necropsy and then they dragged the carcass through the arcade because that building is adjacent to where the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the warehouse area is where, where sort of the animals that you don't see exist but so over the years as you can imagine i'm i get uh, more responsibility i get a greater relationship in, with the animals i get a greater understanding of the language of training uh, you just become more comfortable with it in marine land for me felt like a home because uh you know it was a young dynamic crew of people you're working with and you know you're out partying on thursday nights and you're just having a good time all the time or at least you're trying to and even in my experience, for as awful as things were, on the worst of days, it was your friends that you counted on, and it was their shoulders you leaned on, and we all sort of had a perfect level of crazy that was that that you needed to do this job. But the closer you got to making relations or decisions for the animals, you found yourself fighting uh, management. You know, you start to realize that there's a, uh, you know, there's a bottom line, and there's there's uh, and there's and there's the care for the animals, and if I'm going to be the voice for the animals then I don't negotiate that. That's not my position to take. So I, I could I could give a shit whether or not it makes sense to make money if I think that the animals need a rest for one day out of the seven that they work. You know, so as I got closer and closer to the top, it started to be uh, evident that this was more a uh, industry a profit. And, you know, I, this is without even attributing what happened to me and the walrus. I mean, we haven't even gotten into the fact that I was only six years into being a trainer when I met a walrus that would eventually believe that she, that I was her mom. So you can imagine the conflict in leaving that and being a voice for, her. so it, it, my journey was just conflicting and, and, and longer than it should have been. I would have liked to have left a lot earlier, mm-hmm. but you know, circumstances were such that it wasn't easy for me to leave. 
I left at 34 years of age. And I'll tell you something, at 42 now, I still feel like a 22-year-old kid. Forget about it. In fact, I'm in better shape than I've ever been. Unbeknownst to me, working over there had compromised both some mental health and some other physical uh, problems I had. Um, but things you don't know because you're in the environment, you're, you're suffering from the effects of that environment for, for a long time. So when I think of how some of the things that affected me environmentally there, and I, I attribute it to what was going on to much of the health of the animals, you know, you can you can attribute a lot of their deaths to just straight up the environment. It's it's the environment that that kills them. Oh, that imprinting scene, like I like get emotional just thinking about it. Um, like as a mom, like that's, huh, it's like so heart heartbreaking that <clears throat> sorry, huh, that you would have this like animal think that you're it's it's mom, and then you see it getting mistreated like that. And then you have to leave and you can never see this this animal again. And it's like, whew, what's the difference between like someone that like hurts and like feels this and recognizes that this is like a living, loving creature that that has social bonds to people who are like, this is a dollar sign. Like where like where's the Where's the difference between that? Because you see that a lot at like a lot of these parks, whether it's like a marine park or a zoo, and then the people at the top are just so disconnected from what's actually happening. It's like, do they do they ever um, participate in like the vet checks or the training or like the play? Like, are they just so far removed from those daily activities that it's easier for them? Or do you just a complete disconnect? It's just a disconnect that when when you when your best interest is the bottom line, you have to answer to somebody. You know, my answering was to the vets and ultimately, eventually to management and management's decisions were push, push, push all the time. You know, it just wasn't there was a complete disconnect. And whereas I was trying to represent the interests of the animals and I thought that I was a valuable voice in that capacity. I thought that's why you wanted me. I thought you wanted me for my expertise in telling you what it is that's that's in the interest of the best animals. And I say my expertise because over time I became an expert. I knew those animals better than anyone. I say this not as a spiteful person who wants to, Hey, I was the best. No, no, because the veterinarians will tell you, will have told you, I mean, it's well documented. I was the best. I had that relationship with those animals, man, that I love them. I, I did feel myself the luckiest person on the planet to be able to be so close to them, but that mm -hmm. is a double-edged sword, right? That's why I, I try very often tell people, don't attack the people that are working at Marine land. First off, they're trying to put food on their table and, uh, you know, the, the, the struggle to survive is personal and greater than anyone that, that you and I can, can, can judge anyone else for. So we leave it as such an out, out of the gates, but because first off, it should be noted, there's, these aren't high paying jobs. Okay. These mm -hmm. people aren't living in a lap of luxury. It's the one thing if you, but it's not, it's not. So the struggle is real over there to begin with. And if you love animals, then getting out of the business is even is just as difficult as it is getting in and getting in is tough. I mean, there's a, there's a, at least when I started, there are a lot of people that wanted that job. Mm -hmm. And we were reminded all the time that, Look, if you don't like it, there's the door. There's a thousand people waiting outside those gates, waiting just to sign their name on a dotted line and kick your ass out. It's just like, wow, you're reminded that on a daily basis by Marine Land, you know, and and the sea and the likes of SeaWorld. It's a very cult-like environment. So when you're young, it's tough. I mean, you know, it's a it's a fun place to work in. But man, did the world change? It changed fast. And now what's happened is it's given power to not just the consumer in that because we've always had the power to mm -hmm. vote for, for, with our dollars. The question becomes what what is it that we're supporting and these days the message is no longer merely a jingle on on a commercial or some bullshit science segment where a scientist comes over and shows you a bunch of footage of animals in the wild and then pets an animal at marine land with a trainer and you know attribute it to some level of science and stuff no no, no. these days you know people like me former employees people that know and, and had had access to to information and provides like i have videos and 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 and, and footage and whatnot you know we are now we, like in my example, I've become a sort of media empire on its own just by virtue of being able to use social media and through my through the various contacts I've made through all of this. We really have been empowered. So the corporations are out there and they 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 always controlled the message. You know, mm -hmm. the jingle was cute, the jumping of the whales. You were there. You were there yeah. as a child. You bought it. Yeah. As a child, this was magical, right? Mm -hmm. You wanted to do what I did. You know what's crazy about all that is they sold you, they sold you this idea of these magical relationships that didn't exist. And yet I actually have it. I'm the one guy who has that mm -hmm. weird magical relationship that everyone wants with an animal. I got mm -hmm. it. And I can assure you it's, it's a curse because it's a perspective changing thing. But it's also life altering. You mentioned being a mom and you immediately started to tear up at the prospect of that feeling. I never felt anything the likes of this. I've mm -hmm. had cats and dogs.
hugs and I love them. Don't take anything away from what I'm saying here, but there's nothing like what I felt when I imprinted on that animal and to see her, the level of urgency in her wanting to be with me and what, and knowing what it means for me to be with her. And now attributing that to every other animal there that's been ripped away from their mom, but Uh. we didn't know the extent and the power of it because we didn't have the experience here. It is, it's on display. It's there. So, that changed me, man. I became a mom in a way, right? I'm not a dad. I, I, mm-hmm. I don't have children. That, that's that been my experience of what it's like having one. So this is like, uh, it's sort of hostage-like. You can imagine where it is that I dig. You know, people say, man, you have to dig deep to, to endure this thing. It's like, to be quite honest, it's been easy. It's, it's mm-hmm. like that mother who lifts the car off their tra- off their off their trapped child one mm-hmm. arm those moms are lifting those yeah. cars up you know mm-hmm. i feel the same way i carry the weight of the world on my shoulders to to pursue this and it's the pleasure of my life did you so when that um imprinting happened did you were you aware of like the exact moment like did you feel anything no i felt something in that this is weird i took note of it because i've never mm-hmm. seen anything like that it was all sort of like this this simultaneous and weird thing it was like this large breath. So you saw the nostrils, but then you saw something in the eyes where she looked up at me and the, the look was different. Whereas before it was looking around, looking around panic. Now it was staring directly in my eyes and always wanting to reach her face up at me. Always. It was mm-hmm. that change. I didn't know what it meant, but she was following me everywhere. But also bear in mind at the time there was chaos happening everywhere. There's this chaotic scene. So while I'm trying to tell someone like, Hey, look, she keeps following me. <laughs> Everyone's sort of wrestling another walrus and it's chaos. So by the time it all had settled and was said and done, and I'm trying to tell people what had happened, like, hey, look, <laughs> you know, we'd already, we, we, we decided to go for lunch, or whatever the procedure was done. I'm talking about people like, oh, that's weird. Yeah. I assumed it was said and done. You don't think anything of it. Mm-hmm. In the background, I'm hearing an incessant barking, incessant barking. Someone's calling for her mom. What the hell is oh. that? I go out there. She sees me. Now she wants to be with me every, every waking moment of every hour of every day. And it's an obsession. Holy shit. What has just happened? Mm-hmm. Wow. So um, on a podcast I was listening to, it said that you took a little bit of a break and traveled a bit and came back. Was part of that because of the ecosystem? Like you just needed to get out of that environment? Yeah, I started in 2000. Uh, I remember when our first whale died. Uh, about a week later, maybe even less, I'd asked, hey, listen, I need to just go take a few days off. And, and they gave it to me. So I went out, I went away for 10 days. That was, uh, again, that was a, that was in 2000. This mm-hmm. was early. 2003 rolls around. Well, it's not just one animal dying. It's a few. And now I don't really sleep at night. I'm just, I'm just, uh, and you know, I'm, I should, it should be noted. I'm already a sort of like hyper anxious dude, like uh, depression issues, all this stuff. I mean, everyone's on everyone in retrospect, I would like to have known what a healthy me could be like. I didn't know at the mm-hmm. time, but here mm-hmm. I was in my environment and working with my you know, in the compromised self that I was, but I was already, these, these deaths and these scenes affected me. I don't like seeing blood stuff like this. So I had asked management, like, look, I've got an opportunity. I had a friend who lived in South Korea and he just said, dude, come on over here. Like, just get over here and come, come spend six months, a year, whatever I can like jobs are, you can find a job. I didn't have a university degree. So, you know, to, to work legally in South Korea, you would have had to have had, I didn't have nothing. Mm-hmm. And I just, bought a ticket but but it was with marine lens uh uh you know they gave me the, they gave me their their support and their blessing to leave and i did i left for just shy of a year went to south korea did some teachings uh it, i did some traveling you know japan uh thailand all, all the entire area and when while i was in thailand uh my then girlfriend and i were considering actually staying but it was because i had made the promise to marine land that i would return i said you know i said i would i'm not gonna abandon i'm gonna go back Mm. And, you know, you wonder sometimes when those decisions in life, you know, but my decision to go back obviously changed. But to be fair, six months later to the date that we left, the island of Kopipi got hit by a uh, by a tsunami that wiped it out. We would have wiped out exactly where we were planning on on staying. So it was like wow. kind of this weird fate situation. that it was, it was absolutely best we'd be that we'd left. I love looking back at those moments where there is like that philosophical fork in the road and you made like mm-hmm. a very like A or B decision. Um, and then like you said, like the tsunami hit. So it kind of validates that you did take the right path because I believe in like fate and destiny. I also believe in free will. I think that they can coexist, but I love those moments where you're like, holy shit. And at least I think I'm, I'm heading to the right trajectory. You think there's a level of free movement within 
divine sort of fate? Yeah. I th so the best best way I've ever had it explained to me is like um, like life and like your realm of possibilities is like a bowling alley and you have your bowling lane and ideally you want to kind of stay in that lane and like a perfect life of you following your path would be like a strike. But there's an infinite a number of ways that you can throw the ball and hit the pins. And then another analogy is like if you go way off course and you end up in someone else's lane, um, but it's still contained to that bowling alley. Um, so I feel like like that makes sense. Like there's there's a lot of things you can do and can choose to do and paths that you can lead, but it's still contained. It's as if uh, you can expedite or make as long as you'd like or make as easy as you'd like or make mm -hmm. as difficult as you'd yes. like your path, but you're getting to a place, you're ascending regardless. Yes. And then for me, I've at least like with my I look back at certain, uh, you know, forks in the road or like hardships, and I look at those as like the universe or God or whatever you want to call it giving you like hints. Like, do you really want to do this? Are you really making the right choice? And things get harder and harder and more and more difficult because it's. I feel like your the whole purpose is to to be happy, to feel love and to experience yourself in the fullest way possible. So I feel like when all of those hardships happen, it's it's God or the universe trying to get you back on course. And it's so you're like, are you saying, sure, are in, you sure? So you're saying in every which way that I fought, every which decision to have to, <laughs> to have to speak in the media, every which way I tried to resist that path that seemed to scream to me, sorry, son, you're going down, you're going into a place that, uh, that buckle up. And I, in every which way, was like, no, 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 no. And then something else would happen. I'd be like, I, that can't happen. And then something else happened. I'd be like, as if that was the thing that would happen, that I said that if it did, I would do something. And then, well, no, maybe I'm not ready yet. Boom. It's like, okay, I see I don't have a choice in the matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just got to go with it. I had every choice taken away from me, it seemed. I always say that in the, the entirety of this, of this journey, I haven't made a single choice. But I say that because every which way that I tried to sway from making a decision, I had those choices taken away. So I got sort of bottlenecked into exactly where it is that I had no choice but to go. But by virtue of resisting it, I probably made it more difficult. But either way, I'm still exactly where I was intent on being, mm -hmm. right? Resist yep. or not. Yeah, it's that what you resist persists mentality. You know what I mean? So yeah. I think that too. So uh, when we talk about these people, and it's so easy, we we do it in all facets. Like if we see someone being wrong, and we're like, you're wrong, and we're going to force you to do the right thing, then it's kind of like that power versus force. Like if you push on someone's hand, their natural response is to push back, and they don't even think about it. So it's like how instead of doing something in a forceful manner, which I see a lot with activists, like they get like the vegans you talk about, like they get very angry, and they try to force aye, aye, their aye, will. Aye, aye. It's never going to work that way. So how do you come from a place of power, a place that is like vibrates at a higher place, right? It's not so aggressive. It's not so angry. And it's so hard because it's your baby, right? Like, and of course you're going to get angry. I would be setting the world on fire if someone took my child from me. But how do you do this in a way that's going to create sustaining change? Like, how do we get these people that don't have empathy that are showing signs of? Um, so, do you know, uh, like the dark, the dark triad? I think it's called. Um, it's like three personality traits that indicate whether or not a person is like a psychopath um, or like a little bit darker. So, there's psychopathy, narcissism, and Machiavellianism. So, Machiavellianism is. Uh, seeing people or things as a means to an end and right. you know they're just they're a way to get ahead or to make money and to serve a purpose and if they don't do that then you don't really invest any time into that so I see and I don't I've never met these people but I see a lot of that in in all business right it's like I don't have empathy for this person animal or thing and it's just a means so how do you get that personality trait to come to the light and to say like, you can make money and you can also give a shit. Like those things don't need to be mutually exclusive. Like how do you have that influence? In my, in my experience, in my experience, some old ideas, especially when it comes to legacy businesses, money-making things, mm -hmm. you've got the, uh, you got the old guard power holding onto it. Sometimes 
they just have to die. And I know this sounds crazy, but the people that are holding on to these ideas, they, they just have to die. And in the, in with those old ideas, or with those deaths go the deaths of the old ideas as well. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the tide is turning at such a momentum way, a momentous way that your best job is to just be prepared. So when you talk about how it is that I can keep my mental sanity amidst all of this, you're like, look, I, I, dude, I feel all this. I have the fire every single day. There are bursts. I have bursts where I have to do. So in every which way that I attribute my physical, my, what's become of my body, I used to be a, like, you know, not this. Okay. Mm -hmm. It used to be not this, uh, but I'm not like a workout guy. I think that it is that my mind has been in a state of constant fight or flight and that my body is now after so many years of constantly being in a fighting state, I've now readied myself to a sort of strange battle like way for endurance. Like I'm, I'm made now for, I'm oddly now made for endurance. Whereas before this just wasn't the case. I mean, I don't even know oddly what to say of it, but it's because I've had to control, I've had to have this level of controlled restraint, mm -hmm. which I also feel is a virtue in life because, you know, being reactive is always, and, and I was, I'm the, I am the worst for it. Like I, there are holes in walls here. They exist. Like, I've been they, they, pretty bad too in my past. With that. So yeah, it's not the way to go. Everybody. But you learn this, you learn this because you, 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 well, hopefully you learn the lessons of it, not improving your situation. any. I mean, it just doesn't. Mm -hmm. So I, I learned patience is a virtue as well. And I've learned a lot of lessons the hard way, but I have lawyers and I'm also surrounded with very powerful people that keep me sane. You know, I, I do have a, uh, if I want to be effective, I can't be the person Marine Land has described me as. So in every which way that they've described me as this violent and this dangerous, uh, uh, maniacal person my job is to not be that person mm -hmm. because if I compromise myself and I do something stupid Marina will hold on to it and then the courts will have reason to say well you know Phil might be just a little bit crazy let's offer Marine Land some level of credibility in their complaints mm -hmm. so my job is to just be like okay Marine Land has tried to do this if I want to be most effective you know I need a lot of things to line up they have you know, it's been eight years since Marine Land sued me, but I needed things to line up. I needed support. I needed help. I needed this. I needed that. But here we are. And um, I've just had that one goal in mind. If I can get that, if I can get that walrus, well, I can't compromise. So it's, I know it's crazy. You want to rip the doors down and go get her. Mm -hmm. That doesn't help me and it doesn't help her. No. I have to sit down here. It's, it's the most difficult thing to do, but it's what the purpose of the lawsuit was it's to make me crazy you can even almost say that the lawsuit was if you know if most people were to fight as vigorously as i have it, it is intended to either make you crazy make you broke or make you dead you mm -hmm. know some lawyers leave the legal field because their clients die like um litigation is a very stressful and dangerous thing mm -hmm. so i'm blessed in that i've come this far with the support that i have because i it also gives me the opportunity to reveal the players and, and the darkness of this whole thing. Marine Land sued me for $1.5 million in 2013 for plotting to steal a walrus. Well, here's the beauty thing about, uh, about uh, lawsuits. It's on them. It's the onus is on them to provide evidence and to prove this. Well, they've had eight years to prepare. They have nothing. I mean, every single thing that they've attributed to me has been absolute fiction story. But if I didn't come up with now in excess of $350,000 to afford eight years of jumping through hoops through all the various legal motions that they continue to do, um, I would have been like everyone else, just merely squashed, silenced, and that's it, just by virtue of the, of the, of the punch, like the corporate, the corporate fist, if you will. But because I've had all the help and everything else, Marineland's at the end of their ropes. They, there's nothing left. We have only to basically set trial, and they've had basic – they have like two of these – like last second resort options left because in every lawsuit, basically uh, a corporation in, in, in slap suits, if you will, they just have you jump through various legal motions all the time. It's just constantly a complaint within the, the arguments of the lawsuit. So it's not about the merits of the lawsuits. It's just arguing over words and whatnot on the way up, but they're very expensive processes. They cost an excess of 15 to $20,000 every time you do it. Well, Marine Land's run out of options. Like the judge is basically like, okay, so it's time to go to trial. And no one's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So I mean, I can't break the news of where we're at yet because my lawyer has till this Friday to respond with materials. And thereafter, we're, we're back into another motion where the judge will make a determinants. <clears throat> excuse me. I believe that we'll win and we'll win a lot of money. 
and I'll try to get the media on it because that's my job is keep Marineland lying and in the media. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but we're preparing for trial, man. There's no greater. Well, first, it should be noted in every which way that we've been going to trial and Marineland doesn't want us to. I've been trying to make it easy for them. Let's just move the walrus. Let's get her out of there, right? Let's mm-hmm. just move her. I've been trying mm-hmm. to do this since day one. They don't want to, so we keep fighting. Well, now at some point, they have to take me to trial and before a judge provide evidence of all this crazy shit that I've done. They, I've done nothing. They have zero. They have nothing. So what happens? So how does that work, though? So when you sue someone for that much money with no evidence, how is that legal? How is it legal to permanently cripple someone with no evidence? So it used to not be. And then uh, maybe like five years ago, uh, the province of Ontario, where we live, passed what's called anti-slap legislation. In fact, I was a, I was a, uh, uh, a witness to it. I spoke at uh, a committee. And what that means is uh, Marine Land, if they were to sue, so, so uh, the, a, a SLAP lawsuit is an acronym, S-L-A-P-P for Strategic Lawsuit Against Public Participation. So courts or people uh, of influence will use it to sort of keep people from talking about them in the public domain in the hopes of not changing rules and laws and whatnot, you know, so try to keep the public from participating in a, in a public debate about your practice, if you will. Mm-hmm. But take an Epstein, for instance, he's the type of guy who would have sued people, you know, take like these, these the types of people who had, who have either reputations to, to, to preserve and hide mm-hmm. and crush the people that are otherwise trying to create the dissent or whatnot. So that was passed as, uh, as illegal, but they didn't retroactively, uh, allow for it to, to be practiced. So unfortunately, I'm under the old law, the old rule of law. So I'm sitting here actually watching this law that was yeah. designed to protect us. And it's out of reach to me as a mechanism. Wow. To, to, yeah, dude, welcome to my life, right? And I've been doing this for a, a long time. I'm not just passing legislation to protect animals. I'm also passing and, and speaking on behalf of whistleblowers. So I'm, I'm being crushed while trying to, to, but I'm still here and look, I'm talking to interesting people. I'm having a nice time. So I, hey, everything's good. Every, we're, we're all going to where we're, where we're destined to be. What I think is crazy is part of your, the documentary, um, you were like, I just want the fucking walrus. I think that's all I want. Like, I just want the walrus. And I tried, it's going to sound ridiculous. I tried Googling how much a walrus costs. <laughs> like how mm-hmm. much does it cost for these marine parks to get a walrus? And Surprisingly, like the numbers are really hard to find. The closest thing I found um, was like one thread and it was suggesting like 8,000 pounds, which I guess is probably upwards of 10,000 US. US yeah. um, does, well, do you, did you have any like insight into the cost of acquiring these animals? Because mm, I, I had some insight in that I saw, <laughs> actually, I don't want to say what I saw because okay. It just implicates people from countries that are just more dangerous than I care to implicate. To get involved, yeah. I saw stuff. I couldn't, I can't tell you how much I saw, like in terms of of the value of the transaction of what I for sure was witness of, but there was lots of it. Um, But if you were to say something to the effect of $10,000, yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. I think that that would be a ballpark ballpark figure because, I mean... First off, it should be noted that they're not very difficult to catch. They're not, you know, it's not, it's one thing to try to capture an orca mm-hmm. and then sell it. It's another thing to to storm a beach with a shotgun, blast a few rounds, grab a couple babies and throw them in your boat. Uh, yeah, it's very ugly. I mean, you would have seen some of the scenes in the documentary, which by the way, I appreciate you watching. It's a, that's a grassroots. I mean, my campaign to try to push this film is first off, it should be noted that, uh, man, I say that a lot. It should be noted that. <laughs> I should note. We that. all have like those little catchphrases <laughs> we use. It's fine. I'll take a note on that. Um, it's a uh, you know, COVID times is just an absolute worst possible times to release a film. If you can imagine, it just was took the 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 wind out of all film releases and what these were supposed to be big theatrical events and whatnot. I was supposed to be on tour and traveling. That oh wow! Wiped, down, uh, wiped to zero, right? And uh, so it's really, a, I've got a, I'm pushing a grassroots campaign to sort of get eyes on this thing. It's tough. It's a tough, uh, it's, we're, and we're also a small Canadian film in a big ocean, right? So mm-hmm. I'm glad that, uh, that you did get it, that you did watch it and watch it to its entirety. I assume, oh, it was, too. it was, oh yeah, of course. Everyone oh, needs wow. to watch it. I think it was great. Yeah, it was great. I, like I said, I wasn't bullshitting. Like I probably cried like at least 10 times. Like those movies, yeah. documentaries, I should say, just really get me because I just feel I don't, I don't understand how people don't 
have that empathy for this this creature like to and i know like the vegans will be like well you eat meat and again like the buddhist butcher like it's a real thing like i like have an appreciation for that sacrifice of the animal but that doesn't take away from the fact that i like respect and love these animals like those things coexist for me um when it comes to like protecting these animals do you think as science progresses and we learn more about consciousness that we're gonna look back at this kind of like the coliseum i think we already do i think those who are in the know already do and that's why we fight so hard anyone who's any anyone that's gotten close enough to the industry be it scientists or trainers just by virtue of experience and whatnot Mm -hmm. everyone will tell you that this thing needs to stop that this all of this the entirety of this practice needs to stop um the emotional toll. I mean, I can, I can attest to it personally of separating a baby from its, from its mother or and especially males, males, when they're torn from their mothers in, with whales and, and in my experience, uh, pinniped cetaceans as a whole, those, the males just die younger. It's because they're so vulnerable. They're just mama's boys. These, these animals. Same with babies. I can attest to that. <laughs> these, these animals will never leave their, their mother's lives, their, their mother's side for the entirety of their lives, say for very brief periods of like foraging or mating and whatnot. But, but aside from that, these big male orcas will never leave their mother's side beyond the distance of like a body's length. They're mama's boys. When you tear them from them at a young age, you see what happens to them. They're broken. So mm-hmm. no one can, and their level of consciousness is like, it's the thing that, bothers you the most as you get closer and closer to them it's one thing to look at something that's majestic it's another thing to start to relate to them and then uh i've had the benefit of seeing whales in the wild dolphins in the wild the animals that i worked with are hardly a a a version of that i mean they're drugged they're starved they're they're reduced to, to to puppets i mean it's awful they're not they're not healthy weights they're not able to use the things that make them majestic. They can never get up to any of their top speeds. They're not able to, they don't, I mean, vocalizing is difficult for them, Mm -hmm. you know, separating these animals and mixing them. And, you know, it's just an awful practice. And I think that we already look back at this as a, as a barbaric practice. It's just, we, we don't collectively yet. Mm -hmm. And so there is something called the hundredth monkey effect where collectively as a society, everyone sort of adopts a new level of, uh, of, of morality or, you know, that, that the practice changes and it changes very quickly. I think, I think we've gone past that. I think the, the paradigm shift has started. We're just, everything's been under that boiling point waiting. We're just mm-hmm. waiting for that small little catalyst. I think COVID did it. I don't think people are going to leave the confines of their homes after this period to go to a zoo. I think they're going to go on the first thing everyone's going to say is, this sucks. I know what that feels like. Whereas oh, wow. before we never knew that people are now, you know, there's all the meme. Look, we live in a meme world and all the, some of the more powerful memes are, Hey, did, how's, how's your last four months been sucks. And then they show an animal that's been in captivity for 40 years, pacing its cage or swimming in circles. So oh, I think wow. the perspective really changes moving forward. So I think the paradigm shift is amidst us. I think all of this changes very rapidly. And again, the, uh, the, the market is decided by, uh, by, the, by people's votes. They decide with their dollars. And uh, SeaWorld is not a place people give a shit to go to, and especially a place like fucking Marine Land, which uh, SeaWorld is a day at the spa versus Marine Land, you know? Oh, man. I can't. So that footage was really rough when you were going down um, that little walkway and you had like these tiny little cells that like the animal could barely move in. And you're like, how long are they in there? Like that isn't stimulating at all. Like that's, I just don't, there's so much land there too. So I guess, is it possible? Cause I'm like very anti captivity. I'm anti, I, I was doing a little bit of research and it was really infuriating because most of the stuff that was coming up was like pro marine parks, pro zoo. And it was like the benefits of captivity. These animals um, live longer, healthier lives. And you're like, you know that's not true. You absolutely know that's not true. And it's like, I think half for orcas, I don't know what the comparable number is for walruses or seals or dolphins, but we know that's not true. Like they're like you said, they're not reading, they're not using their instincts, right? They're not using, they're not hunting, they're not going to top. They're all drugged. They're all drugged. They're all, all drugged. They're all drugged. 
oh my gosh. So you're like, you know, that's not, that's not the case. Um, but you have some people that are just like ignorant to it, right? They just want to go see a really cool animal and they don't think anything of it. Like they're like, oh, well, they don't think they're not human. They're lesser than. And when I was trying to like, I guess, compare it to the Coliseum, I was like, well, how long did that go on? Because people thought that was okay, right? Like, let's just go battle each other and kill this elephant and all of these things. And that was about 400 years until there was a shift in like just interest and what was socially acceptable and a couple of other like reasons. And then I Googled and found the first walrus was put in captivity in 1608. And then the first orca was 1961. So I'm like, we are so behind. We are so behind like that, that shift in consciousness and what's like acceptable. And I'm like, I think, I hope that you're right with COVID creating some kind of um, connection of the dots and people seeing like, man, this sucks for me. Like think of how awful for, for anyone that does have like, um, like a healthy lifestyle and you move and you not necessarily work out, but like you're doing something for your body. Think of like when you take time off, like how much like a week impacts like your, your mental ability, right? Like I get angry. I get like just a lot, um, like quicker to any like emotion really. I get like sad faster. My body starts hurting. And it's like, what do you think this animal that's supposed to be you know, diving and hunting. Like, what does that do to them? We don't want to talk about it because they're just animals. You know, they're in pools. And if they spy hop, if they lift their heads above the two foot wall that surrounds them, they see trees. And the reality is for the animals that are at Marine Land, you are thousands of kilometers or miles from any ocean. So their percentage chance of ever having any semblance of a natural life again are, is almost net zero. Imagine like they're, they're doomed and they know it. They, they lift and they don't see an out. There's mm -hmm. like every single day they're trying to imagine because they're so intelligent. Every single day they're trying to crack the formula of trying to get back home. That's it. That's all they're trying to do. Every which way is trying to figure out how to get out. It's like, it's a strange thing, but that's how their minds work until eventually they, they, they suffer from this thing called zucosis where they go on autopilot. You see it all the time. Um, currently there's a whale at Marine land. She's been in captivity, 42 years old. She lives completely alone or an orca named Kiska. She swims in circles, scratches her backs here, does two uh, uh, pumps of her tail here, uh, breathes here and then rolls slightly to an angle here. And then does that on repeat all day until the buck the trainers come with their buckets they they smash the bucket against the, the the grates which summons her to come up and they've got her for about a minute of interest where they shovel the food and drugs into her and let her go again you'll see it with animals uh, bears back and forth in their cage tigers back and forth in her cage there was actually a study that just came out in fact it just uh, someone tagged me in a tweet just yesterday of a bear that was released after 25 years of captivity and in its new um in its new uh, sanctuary, it's still walking the exact same path without the cage bars there. It's just, they just go eventually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what else are you going to do without, you know, that stimu that stimulation? I think anyone would do that because it's got to be comparable to the studies that they've done on um, like solitary, solitary confinement with prisoners. Like those people tend to undergo psychosis as well. Like they lose their, they quite literally lose their mind. So you those people are rationalizing and they're able to negotiate, speak a language. They're able to, they're not also, uh, their, their natural state of being isn't also threatened by virtue of being seen. When animals have eyes on them, it changes them. They don't want to be seen. Their objective in life and the tools that are, that are given to them are to be hidden. Mm -hmm. So when they're seen, it's already a stressor to them. So it's like, imagine the, the, the analogy of the, uh, of the person in solitude, solitary confinement, and now make it significantly worse. Make yourself an alien where you can't speak, negotiate, and you're being seen by something and managed by something that is not your friend and that you can't connect with, you know? That was a connection. I was wondering if anyone was going to make, and people are probably going to think I'm a weirdo for this, but like, obviously a lot of people are talking about UFOs, like all of that stuff's getting released. And like, I wonder if that might be something that shifts our minds with how we treat yeah. animals because here's this other more advanced 
species, right? We don't know if they're the same or if they what they look like, all of these things, because the general uh, public doesn't really have that information. But assuming that they're way more advanced, that they don't speak our language, they might not even communicate the way we communicate, and they look down on us like we're this kind of barbaric, unrefined animal, what if we get put in cages? What if they assume that we don't have feelings or loved ones? And I just feel like it's all it's all connected. And I'm just like, I'm just shocked that the U.S. hasn't followed suit. So with the laws that you helped get passed in Canada, what does that mean for the animals that are still in captivity and like moving forward? So, so the animals at Marineland cannot be sold, cannot be bred. Uh, Marineland can no longer import any... Um, Dolphins, whales, and porpoises. Now, it's important to, to make that distinction because a lot of people attribute uh, marine mammals as a species of animals, but like walruses and, and seals and seals, they're not the same as scientifically uh, whales, dolphins, and porpoises. So they are their captivity is banned. But because, because property laws um, are such that marine lands current uh, collection are their property, they can't merely be seized. So they can't be taken, but because we tied them up with enough red tape, if Marineland intends on exporting any of them, the laws that are uh, that govern these animals now have, have to stay with them. So if Marineland were to export animals to another facility, they could not be bred. They could not be, uh, you know, all of these things. Uh, they cannot be. They cannot perform. Um, so there's a lot of red tape around the animals. Marineland is trying to sell, and you know, but but the unfortunate reality is when you tie a lot of red tape around animals, their value goes down significantly. So Marineland suffered some major, a major financial blow in that they were, you know, breeding animals unmitigatedly and, and selling them and trying to sell and export them. And now, you know, there's a burgeoning industry in China that Marineland would love to have sold the animals to, but now they can't. So finding a home for the animals is a little more, more challenging, but it's a very progressive law in Canada. Uh, if you're going to export the animals, there has to be an attributed um, benefit to the animals, the animals' best interests have to act, it has to be in their best interest. So a lot of the moves that Marineland would like to make might be sideways. And now it comes down to whether or not the country of Canada wants to keep these animals or move them. But again, the laws continue to follow them. But what's most important is to note that there's a whale sanctuary. It's called the Whale Sanctuary Project. And they've got a destination, they've got a location rather approved in uh, out east in, of, in Canada. And uh, so call it Newfoundland area on the coast and they're going to build a sanctuary. So they're going to fence off an, uh, of this massive environment and animals will be able to live there and be, you know, sort of released, if you will. I mean, if animals can be, that will be the end goal, but those that will not will be always provided with, uh, you know, the top, top level of care by mm -hmm. the top the industry, top scientists and, and whatnot. Anyways, this is like sort of the goal, the end goal for Marine lands animals, at least for me, is that they wind up there. I'd like to mm -hmm. see that happen. So the law in Canada is such that once that place is available to them, you know, Marina will have a hard time saying no to having them move. So we hope that that gets built very quickly. But other than that, you know, I don't know. Marineland is, again, they're stuck not breeding the animals. You know, I, I do my best to have people watch. But because, because Marineland actually sued the uh, Ontario Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals after they charged marine land with multiple counts of animal cruelty uh there's no one left to sort of watch marine land or to mm -hmm. or to sort of oversee the care of their animals because now the <laughs> now that even the government won't go in there so i've sort of become marine land so sort of become their sheriff I, I sort of i sort of keep them as best i can accountable uh but i can say that there are definitely some missing belugas at marine land currently let's say about five and they've wow. not been exported I'm calling them definitely dead. Mm -hmm. um, but again, these are just things that, in fact, some of the animals, okay, breaking news. Some of the animals that were meant to be exported to Mystic Aquarium, Marineland now has to change the permits because one of which have died, has died, and others are, already, are actually sick. So because Marineland has made an agreement to sell animals to Mystic Aquarium, there was five to be exported. Uh, that took a little bit longer time because of the red tape of the, of the bill that we had passed. And also there's a, a, an animal rights agency in the States that are now suing to keep that export from happening. And they have good argument as to why uh, the delay itself 
it just offers perspective of just how sick these animals are that one died one of the five and it sounds like multiple others are now sick mm-hmm. now, the situation's bad man but we're just doing every which way that we can in a in an otherwise very tumultuous political world to create change like look if you're an owner of these animals and you see a guy like me come around saying hey i'm coming to take your animals well you've got all the money and all the and, and all the guns if you will then what's what chance do i stand it's just gonna take time it's gonna mm-hmm. take time but we are taking those animals well, I mean, you've done a tremendous job for being one person and going against like this massive corporation. I mean, you are quite literally like the reason these laws are are being passed. Um, so given that a walrus is relatively cheap considering, right, eight to $10,000 ballpark, your um, GoFundMe page has done very, I would say very well comparatively to other GoFundMes. Like, why won't they give you this walrus? <laughs> why? It's I not like you're, ter- you're not trying to take him home, right? You're like, you're actually just trying to relocate Smushy to like a proper facility. What if I told you that I'll even one up it, I'll pay for the entirety of the operation of moving her. And in fact, what if I said that I have enough people ready to fund a place for her that I could have, we could have broke ground a long time ago. This thing wasn't just, hey, Marineland, how about don't suffer millions and millions and millions into the hundreds of million dollars of loss over the pride of this animal. It was, dude, I'll get rid of the lawsuit. Let's just get rid of everything and let's just move this animal so I can I can sleep at night. Mm-hmm. I, I will have done my, I uh, will have done what any good mother will have, what does, fight till he, she gets their baby. Mm-hmm. That I, I tried to express to them that that's never going to change and it's only going to be more and more difficult. They don't seem to be uh, very reasonable. Mm-hmm. I think that's evident to anybody who's watching this is that uh, this is more of a revenge, uh, um, a process of revenge that is being seen through than a process of justice. But again, I'm trying to catch up with justice. So we are in a strange race that if Smushi and her baby, because we learned that Marine Land impregnated her and she had a calf back in June, if they're still alive, then uh, then I still I'm then I'm getting them out of there. And if they're not, then the justice I seek is in the court of law I, that they you know abuse over the years to try to keep me out of there from being able to get her. Mm-hmm. It's a double edged sword, but I I tried to I tried to keep it cheap and easy for them the entirety of the time. I didn't want to have movies made about this, right? I know it's a crazy world. Walrus moms don't want to be on the cover of newspapers and stuff. They just don't. They just want to be chilling. They just <laughs> so like who like who is this mastermind though? So like the original owner is is dead, right? And then his son passed away as well. And from what I remember, it's his wife now that kind of is running the operation. And I'm assuming she was probably oh she's not okay. No, so no, she's there. Okay, and her name is president, but she's not running the operation. No, Rina's so who- lawyer is not, is running the entirety of the thing, and it's and it's through the instruction of the now dead owner. So, which is just mind blowing. You're like, okay. It's only mind blowing if you don't consider the best interests of the lawyer in this picture. And if you consider Mm -hmm. the vulnerability of a elder owner who who may not have a full uh, grasp of the image that's being presented before her. Are you able to talk to her or is that like frowned upon? If I could, well, not just frowned upon, it would compromise my legal standing and that the lawyer would call me this dangerous threat and have to have the police intervene and do all this crazy stuff. But uh, that's the opportunity that I wish I could have because I, I feel like her best interest. And again, I love Marie. I think Marie is a wonderful person. I always have. In fact, even John for as vile as he was, and he was, I still had empathy for the man. And I, and I, I had a level of understanding of him. He came from a different place. I, I, I empathize and understand people. I'm not this put up a wall. You're different than me. That's it. I tried mm-hmm. to understand what fuels people. It's mm-hmm. the best way to effectively negotiate with them. So look beyond the, 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 the flash and the 3D, if you will. Mm-hmm. So in her, she's a, she's a kind soul. She's wonderful. And I wonder if that isn't working against her in her vulnerability and her now um, fabricated fear of me. Because... There was a time when I was in her bedroom treating her cat with the veterinarians. There was a time when I was invited to go have dinner by her at her home. These times are now behind us and they're behind us because of a fictional story that the lawyer, by virtue of continuing to propagate, uh, profits a, a, a 
a great deal from. So there's a lot of interesting things around this. And I do wish there were more eyes because I think there are far greater injustices than just the, uh, just the abuse of the animals. Oh, I, I mean, I totally agree, but you have to start somewhere. Right. So I think I know what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah I know yeah. what I'm doing. So for you, like, so I think your story is going to be like such a catalyst for other countries, or at least I hope that it is. Um, as far as like progressing and making these laws to make it illegal to do these shows and to steal babies from their moms. I mean, if you watch these videos, like they're like heartbreaking. Like how, like there's not enough money in the world to get me to be one of those people or just as it's, it's dark. It's dark. So what would you say to someone who's like trying to create change because you you have so far a very successful story obviously you're not happy where you're at right now because you still want you want smushy but you've you've made a, a big wave the thing that i would say to any aspiring activists or people out there that are gut checking themselves to create change is number one is check yourself first look within yourself and determine what it is that is inspiring your need to, to create this change. And are you in fact running from something or going for something? Because if you are looking, if you're running from something, you don't have the long game. There's just no long game for you because if you're going to create the level of change that is necessary to have, to be impactful, you've got to, you have to set yourself up at the edge of the universe and throw yourself off and be, you know, and be willing to be both caught and, or, uh, bounce off a lot of rocks on the way down. So you yourself have to be coming from a place of of, of being grounded. What I what I find too often is activists are more off wanting to ignore something else, and then they throw them into something, and there's just no longevity in that. It's always short lived. It's trendy, mm -hmm. and those things are I, I call it proper criminals. I need proper criminals. I need people <laughs> that come to me with a healthy bank account already, with a healthy relationship. The bed is made. Uh, they've they've lived their life long enough that it isn't an identity that goes that tr that goes well with their tattoos to be to be holding signs. It's because their passion is such that they're willing to see through the cool stuff, and they're willing to in uh, to engage with a level of the of perspective sacrifice. So what I say to people is balls to the fucking wall. Like, <laughs> it, it is if you're gonna do it. Uh, put yourself in the hands of the universe, sacrifice. And uh, I mean, I know that I've been given everything I've needed throughout my, my big change when we had discussed uh, forks in the road was I was in that bedroom over there on the floor in the, in the fetal position, rocking back and forth, deciding whether I was going to speak out about animal cruelty or not. And that I just, I, I, the prospect of living with myself, if I've just merely walked away, especially by virtue of looking out the front window and seeing Marine land, like, well, am I going to stomach having walked away and kept, and, or am I going to put myself on the edge of the earth, get sued, have the police and tough guys sent to my house and have, you know, all this craziness. Well, I'd resolve that if, if it was, if there was to be any uh, amount of change, it would require a name and face and, and an ultimate sacrifice. And so that's what I did. Not everyone has the, not everyone has the opportunity to be me. I, you know, I didn't have kids uh, at the time. I was blessed with a healthy enough bank account in that I won some stupid reality TV show. So, uh, you know, I was able to quit my job, even if for only a brief moment. But again, I wasn't thinking. I out of the gates, I was just swinging for the fences, hoping someone would catch me, and I was caught. I, again, I was very lucky. I've won the lottery 15, 16, 20 times throughout this journey, you know, hanging just by a thread or by the skin of my teeth from disaster and coming back. Not mm -hmm. everyone needs to do that, but you know, there are professional people out there doing things and you can help them. And I know it doesn't ever seem, doesn't seem very uh, appealing to many, but sometimes that is the most effective thing you could do is keep yourself out of someone's already awesome momentum fight and mm -hmm. help them let mm -hmm. them go. So for me, my, my battle's personal. I always like when people help me. Uh, it's not that I don't need the other, you know, of course I need people on the sidelines and, and doing things like coming to protests and all this fun stuff, but don't sacrifice your life to help me. Just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, find your purpose and, and you'll know it. Here's the other thing I say to people, don't force anything. If you're forcing yourself to find a passion, oh dude, you are so, it's like you're in the wrong lane at that point. You're just <laughs> yeah. not in the right lane. Mm -hmm. Would you say that this is your destiny? Like this is, 
part of your, um, like your fate, if you will? I've had no choice in every which way that I've tried to fight this, even down to where when I applied to go on the reality TV show, I knew just by being selected to, to, uh, to audition for it, I knew I was winning. I could feel it in my bones. And I knew that it meant trouble, even to the point that if you go back to a 2010 interview with me, it says, what are you going to do with the money? I'd won like $50,000 um, tax free, right? In Canada, this was like a, this was a, this was a sexy amount of money. Mm -hmm. That is for a bum like me. So no, but, that is, that is a good amount of money. Right. It was a nice chunk of change when it was. And I knew, and in that interview, I said, there's like, what are you going to do with this? I said, you know, trouble has a fine, a way of finding me. And I'm just going to hold on to this for a rainy day. But that money is what I use to, to hire lawyers for every person who spoke out against Marine Land that got sued. I just started cutting checks like this and said, wow. okay, let's fucking go and let's see what happens. And from that moment on, everything lined up for me in such a way that I just stood there and I was just witness and I flowed and it's wonderful. And then there are times when I feel as though I resist, when I try to make things happen and when I try too hard, that's mm -hmm. when I find myself in a, in an imbalanced state in an ineffective state. Mm -hmm. So I try to just, you know, return to that place of, okay, there's times where you're up. There's times when you're down, there's times to sit and rest. And so that's it. I, I, it's been absolutely my fate. How it ends for me. I don't know how I believe it ends exactly as I've had to believe it from day one that I'm getting that fucking walrus. I really hope you do. Honestly, I do. And I, I see all the signs like leading towards you being like the hero of the story. And I think you have very supportive people behind you. And you've obviously been doing a serious media run. Um, you've been on some really, really huge podcasts. So I don't think that those things would be lining up for nothing. I have to agree with you. Like, uh, it was when I stopped resisting that it, that every, even the perspective of the worst outcomes become far more uh, tolerable or, or you're able to, to look at them from the healthiest of perspectives when you're not resisting anything. It's not, oh no, if that happens, life's over. And I wish I could tell myself from eight years ago, hey, it don't end. You're not going to die. Like, go ahead. Sue you, get sued for millions, bro. It's fun. Like, no one's going to tell me that. But, you know, me in retrospect, if I could put my hands on my shoulders, like, dude, don't beat yourself up over this shit. Come on, man. buckle up. We're going, we're doing what it is we have no choice but to do anyways. What are you going to do? It's like going in for an operation. You're going to complain? No, I'll take the needle, put it in. Isn't that so interesting how you can look back at those moments where you were just scared shitless and you were like, it's all going to be okay. Like I wish my my now self could go to my then self and say, it's all going to be okay. And I think that's such a powerful life lesson. And I mean, I've learned it a hundred times over is anytime like you're trying to fight something or you look at things with a perspective of like fear or anger that it just it makes it worse but the moment you just like and like let go is when everything starts to kind of happen for you there's something to be said and i'm learning it but you know when you face a really difficult decision man sleep on it i know that sounds crazy but the, the unconscious mind has a way of unraveling uh problems that don't otherwise exist and they, it does the work for you it can a lot much mm -hmm. of the work can be done for you in an un if you allow yourself that time, mm -hmm. you know, people don't give themselves enough uh, credit for what, what it is the body and the psyche can do and the for, for itself in the, in, in the realm of healing. But I look back at old patterns that have long since disappeared and I wouldn't have even had known, but you know, I was healing. I was healing throughout much of the pain. You don't know it, mm -hmm. but you know, you are only able to, to realize it once you're, once out of you it. sort of emerge or if, yeah as you come out of these fogs and these different states of being so yeah of course it would be great to you know, the other thing is I, I in those moments i did always think to myself you're going to want to look back on this and so i i have those conversations with myself and i almost have it in a in a real time sense because i can freeze time from the times i was making difficult decision i can revisit myself there i can't hug myself but i feel as though i'm still making the connection to that person i still feel like i'm able to go back and guide somehow oddly. no no 100 percent. it's uh, very similar to like inner child work so um in a lot of like therapy sessions or um some like spiritual spirituality is they have you go back to these traumatic moments or like these moments of hardship at, like a younger self and then having your more mature self with the information that you now have acquired and giving that younger self that information and that that hug and that love and like healing That's that mm -hmm. yeah so you you're doing that without even knowing yeah. 
yeah that's yeah. very but there's cool. a lot I've, I've i've done some therapy and i probably need to do significantly more but the reason that talk therapy especially if it seems to be just a waste of my time is every time i do any sessions within the third session i become the therapist so <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work out for me so you know i'm a i have to find my own ways of, of coping with things but you know whatever gets me through the night well, you guys are legalizing psilocybin now. So, I mean, the work that they do with that in therapy is insane. Like, I want to say I, it's I after do work every single day. <laughs> do you? Well, do you find oh, so do you find that there's a difference, though, if you do it? I've never done them. I actually have like my first um, like session, if you will, scheduled for April. Um, and I'm is that really DMT or ayahuasca. What are you doing? Mushroom. Yeah. Oh, you're doing mushrooms. Cool. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. I have like a shaman and the whole the whole thing. So I'm curious. So they suggest, and again, I'm I'm not speaking from experience yet, but they suggest that there's like a difference when you do it um like recreationally or at a party, which is like very frowned upon in like oh, the spiritual no quest. community. No quest. And then like when you have like a purpose going in and like preferably an elder. So preferably like a clinician or a shaman, whatever like path you want to take, if you want to go more medical or more spiritual, um, that the experience is just different. And then the studies that I was reading were saying like after one, um, like decent dose of psilocybin, like people's depression is gone. People's PTSD is gone. People's anxieties are gone. Um, so with your experience with that, like, are you, are you doing like these big doses with like an elder guidance or are you just kind of self-guiding? That's funny you mentioned that. So I did do an ayahuasca journey some years ago, two mm -hmm. years ago in uh, in a jungle in Mexico. I did it with a, uh, I mean, it was, it was a different experience, but it was nonetheless the psychedelic experience with the ceremony. And that was great. That was like more of a higher dose sort of, and that, that was good for my ego. Now I, I should note that I have a, a pretty extensive uh, uh, history with, with psychedelics uh, spanning from high school to just about all the time since then <laughs> should be noted though. But um, my experience is that I never looked at uh, psilocybins and whatnot as anything but recreation for the longest time. It just didn't occur to me. Even smoking pot was such that you did it at parties while you were drunk to just make you giggle a little bit more. It never occurred to me that this was medication or medicine. My experience with, with smoking pot, at least, or at least in, in, in as it, as it pertains to this is when I was on uh, antidepressant meds and I didn't like them. I never did. I, they didn't work with me. My friend suggested smoking a lot of weed to get off them because I'd been you know, addicted to them. And, just, and I'd ask the doctor, I, I'll, I'll go on, on psychotics as long as they're not addictive. He's like, these ones aren't. And then every time I try to get off them, I was getting these electric shocks between my brains. Every time I moved my eyes, it sounded like those just things were awful. So I kept running back to the medicine cabinet and my friend finally said hey smoke a shit ton of pot bro it's like okay let's try this so i went from uh you know this is about eight years ago so i went from smoking for shits and giggles and otherwise eating mushrooms and, and whatnot for shits and giggles to suddenly being like okay 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 so now we've got this uh medicine if you will or, or rather my perspective changed that suddenly this was a medicine that could be worked with so mm -hmm. i worked myself off these psychotics and suddenly found myself smoking a lot of weed which i admittedly do admittedly do, but my relationship with marijuana is significantly different than most. I mean, you can see that I'm already a motor mouth. I took three bong rips before the, the interview. Had I not, we'd be, you'd think I was, I'd cocaine. be dead. I would be a zombie. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, dude, if I, I could, I could wipe out the entire city with what I, with what I smoke in a day, but my relationship is different with marijuana. It doesn't affect me like it does others. Again, I literally did three bong rips before coming on this show. I, <laughs> I got the bong cleaning right now. I'll show you my little stash in a second. <laughs> But my, my relationship was such as that I, I developed a symbiosis with it. I, it. You know, it works with your consciousness, it, uh, especially when you get into psilocybin. So what psilocybin will do is it's going to strip away from you all of the bullshit. It's going to take away your bullshit filter. And you're going to think less taxes and commercials and this these jingles in your head. And you're going to be brought inside, right? Everything is inside. Everything is inside. The entirety of your experience, the entirety of your, of all of your ex outwardly experience is inside. So it brings you back mm -hmm. you know, and it harness, it sort of tries to harness you to your truest form of self. Now that's in different doses. I mean, there's, the, there's different experiences to have. Now, if there's something that I like to do, which is micro dosing, mm -hmm. which is just so little, such a little bit that you don't consciously feel it. But what it does, the benefit of it is it takes away that edge, that immediate edge of sadness or that even that uh, even that uh, prevalence to, 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 to go towards sadness. Mm -hmm. it, it will 
it will give you that that level of pause. So just a little greater uh, aspect of of perspective from a from like a more sensible rather than like it just grounds you more. Mm -hmm. So I just work with it well. And while we're talking, I may as well just show you <laughs> what it is while we're here. I uh, okay. Let's just take a look. I mean, this is oh, my wow. this is all the various forms of smoke that I smoke on a you know I smoke. Okay, I smoke. But here are. If we're gonna look, I know this isn't the prettiest things. I get the old, you know. But you know, here's my there's the psilocybin there. So you know, I'm not sitting here saying, hey, look, everybody, become <laughs> but here in Canada, it should be noted that it's legal. Mm -hmm. So my use of it is of course responsible. I don't drive when I'm high, blah, blah, blah. But that's been my experience. I, I had a doctor tell me that he expected that there would be a time when everybody would be on antidepressants. And that to me was my wake up call that I wanted to be the exact only person that wasn't. And okay. can that be said, despite the fact that I smoke as much as I do and I, and I take the psilocybin's man, I'm, I'm, I do well with those meds in the same way that I say that I work well with meat. Mm -hmm. I also work well with natural medication. I just do like mm -hmm. for me, in, in, in the state of mind and state of being that I am, I need to go inside more often. That's what I need. It, it mm -hmm. sort of takes you away from the outside a little bit. I think you're going to enjoy the experience. If you've never done it before, do you, do you smoke pot, anything of the sort? Once or? in a while. Um, yeah. You're I'm going not in like sensitive then you're going in. Like, I'm, Holy shit. I'm like someone that has half a cup of coffee and I'm like ready to go oh, or I'll okay. have like one wow, glass of okay. wine and I'm like, Ooh, okay. This is, I'm very sensitive to any kind of like drug, if you will. Um, are you, so yeah. are you afraid at all? Of course. Yeah. Nervous? Yeah. And okay, I know so, so I got to like, let that go before is what they say, but we'll see. You'll be fine, which is the good news. And as soon as you say, Hey, I'm going to be fine, no matter how difficult this is, then that's the good news because every form of that being difficult is intended for the flip side of it to be better. So mm -hmm. work with the medication because the more you resist it, the more it's going to, uh, it's going to make you resist it more like mm -hmm. you have to work with it don't work against it because mm -hmm. it'll it'll just beat you up in the process so, oh, so I know give yourself to it and man i'm, I'm excited for you, to be honest. Thank you. i actually yeah. got invited on on i actually got invited on wednesday maybe to go to toronto to participate in a dmt smoking ceremony which is uh that's a whole other level of wow and i'm thinking about it i am due for a reset so it may happen but uh, I'm weighing it right now. We'll see. So with that, so I, um, I, I have a cop dad and growing up the way that he taught us not to do drugs was like, if you do that, you're going to die. If you do that, you're going to die. Like even with weed, the first time I ever smoked pot, I was like, I'm going to die. Like he just like really drilled that in. So it took a long, long time. And just like r reading like the modern research of like these, the healing properties of all of these plants. Um, I didn't, I never, I didn't smoke till I was like 19. And then that was like the only drug like I, I had ever done. So I was in LA and I got invited to like this like celebrity house party and we're all there hanging out. And I'm like, this is so fun. And they were passing around what I thought was weed. So someone had said it was weed. Would you like to take a hit? Blah, blah, blah. And I take like literally one regular drag of what I thought was a vape. And all of a sudden, like my entire perspective changed and I'm like, what is happening? And everyone like turned into like, I don't even know, like almost like a cartoon. And then I started getting like really paranoid and I like my body felt weird. And it turns out it was weed with DMT. Oh, wow. And I had no clue. I was like, this is not the first experience I would have picked. And you don't just pass that around without telling people. Jesus, like, where like, am I? That's some pillows up or something. Holy. Yeah. People were like handling it very differently. And then as yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Down, I was like, oh, this isn't good. And I was like, I don't even know where I am. I might not get home. Like, so I do want to experience that properly because I heard that that's like such a magical insight that you get from doing that but again i want to do it a knowing that i'm doing it and um be in the right setting so that i can like have the the most fulfilling experience but i think you should go for it yeah it may happen i'm 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 flirting with the idea right now i'm running out of excuses what makes you that. nervous 
Well, I mean, I hate to say it, but we're under this stupid lockdown where you're not allowed to really be leaving the house and shouldn't mm-hmm. be going into like, and Toronto's like particularly nasty right now. So mm-hmm. it's, it's really almost a logistical one where suddenly uh, I go there and I'm in trouble. I can't spend the night. I got to drive my ass back. Now I'm driving my ass back in a snowstorm. And, oh, oh, you know, oh. I don't know. It's just one of those deals where maybe, maybe best to wait a month or two. I don't know. We'll see. The medicine calls you, which is the good news. And this was an opportunity that came about to me and it wasn't, it didn't feel like the calling as much as an opportunity i'll know if it's meant to happen i'll mm-hmm. be there on wednesday if it is believe mm-hmm. me just in the same way that you decided to do yours it it uh the medicine will call you when it's time so i'm not worried about that yeah it's interesting i um i like had started like getting a lot of curiosity around it and then i started seeing like little docu series about it and like goop did one where they took people to south america to do like this ayahuasca mm-hmm. experience Um, And they did like a psilocybin experience and they had these testimonials and this one woman had told like a really personal story about how she was um, suicidal and it was like a daily thing for her to to decide to not to not kill herself and then um, traditional medicine wasn't working for her she said it was like making it actually worse until she discovered mushrooms and then she started doing a uh, microdosing daily and she's been microdosing I think she said I haven't watched the documentary in a while but I want to say it was like over 10 years or 15 years or something and it just for her it went away and I'm like if there's like all of this these crazy testimony she's not the only one right like this is a very common statement that people with depression make that are using mushrooms um which is why uh, companies like maps and um yeah you know they're doing the research because there's something mm-hmm. there so it's like we need to take the stigma away from certain drugs if they have this benefit and realize again it all comes down to money right if you can take one mushroom trip for like i don't know a hundred bucks and then your depression is gone like where is the repeat customer for that how about the fact that marijuana went from being illegal in Canada to being essential within like six months of the law passing? So literally from you're illegal, this stuff is recreational, illegal and everything else to you're now essential. People need their medication. Look, this is my 23 year old cat. Sinus. No way. Yeah. He's 23. Oh, he's baby. Hugs. Oh, he needs his, he needs his comforting hugs. It took him a lot to jump up here, but he just needs this right here. Oh, wow. I didn't know cats could even live that long. He's got like, uh, so I got him when I got back from South Korea, I, uh, I thought the first thing I'll do as a newly minted man at the age of 25, with this is my new independence of getting my own apartment close to the Marine Line. I was going to get a cat. And so <laughs> I went and got this guy. They said uh, he was seven years old at the time. So this is like 2005. So I've got him out of, you know, we've got him at varying ages. I figure if he wasn't seven at the time, he might've been. <laughs> uh, he, he runs the show he gets the mic he takes it but anyways he's uh i had him maybe four years old at the time but he's super old he's my sweetest oldest boy here but now he's got the softest head and i just love it oh my god sorry no you're totally sorry. fine so i wanted to ask given like your um like your experience like you have very rare insight to um, I guess like perspective is as far as animals in captivity goes, like most of us can assume things and you have, you have scientists on both sides saying, yes, animals can thrive and no animals can't. Do you think it's possible for certain animals to do well in captivity and be fulfilled and happy? Or do you think it kind of all is a wash? I think there are, I think there are situations where they can be fulfilled and happy. I think it's rare, mm-hmm. but I think it, depending on what, depending on what the objective is, is if the objective is mere contentment, yeah, that you can, you can achieve contentment in, in certain animals. Can you allow for an environment for which they can thrive? Cause that's, a, that's an entirely different thing than being content in an environment. Mm-hmm. Thriving is a bit more of a challenge. Uh, but do I think it exists? Absolutely. I think there's a model that we're all going towards. I think that's just sanctuaries. Mm-hmm. I don't see a problem in preserving smaller environments for animals that don't necessarily uh, migrate. So let's use seal sea lions as an example. A seal on the side of a cliff, a rock cliff, doesn't need to swim very far to forage, doesn't need to travel very far to, to breed, um, doesn't breed so much so rampantly that it will cause a crazy ecosystem ecosystem imbalance and not nothing that can't be mitigated under a, to a certain extent to uh, um, with with under human care so I do feel like there's spaces where we could find a level of balance over 
even even not so vast environments but does that does that work with lions and elephants and giraffes and and apes and 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 whales well mm -hmm. it becomes a challenge but our responsibility i think as humans is is to you know obviously conserve their natural environment but if we're going to keep them if we're going to hold them and 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 we're going to to if they're going to rely on us we have we have a responsibility of giving them at least a semblance of a free life so that they can be what they're meant to be mm -hmm. a, a whale in a hyperchlorinated pool that that is hardly the size larger than an olympic size pool is not a whale anymore mm -hmm. it's just not so I, I do feel like there are going to be in the future more and more examples of what can be achieved i think there's going to be some level of trial and error and that is fair mm -hmm. if the if the intentions are, are are right i mean look there's there's pain in evolution and there's going to be some level of failure but i think the ultimate goal will be return animals to their most natural state of being which is in their most natural environment preserve and those that can't rescue rehabilitate keep and uh and give them as best you can a, a semblance of a natural environment and and use those to educate the people it, it's all happening it's again the 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 the, vote, the the public vote with their dollars and that's that's the evolution evolution of zoos and those that are going to choose not to evolve well, then we're going to leave them in our dust. No mm -hmm. problem. Yeah, that's the interesting thing is that the um, the science is used a lot, like, you know, to keep them for public education. But you're like, well, what are you studying, though? Because that animal is not yeah. behaving like it would at the, all in the wild. So you're not you've learning. You've gone ahead and attributed a second level to the thought. So, you know, you're rare because most people just say, oh, they're, they're doing science. And then it ends on that. No. You say, well, what level of science can be attributed to the to the wild kid? And then the next person says, where's the popcorn? <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully we get less people asking for popcorn and more people critically, critically thinking because but you're not learning we'll anything. We'll leave the shitty places. We'll <laughs> leave the shitty places yeah. to the people that want the popcorn then. Go ahead and have it. There's going to be fewer and far less and, and less and less people. And eventually what happens is people start feeling shame for supporting those. It, it just becomes, it becomes with a collective conscience uh, change, if you will. So mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not saying, hey, go out there and publicly shame these people. No, I'm no, saying no. by virtue of doing this, you're just not going to want to show yourself. So it, people, their their natural behaviors will eventually change once uh, you know once the uh, the perspective of society catches up. And and we're well on our way. I mean, you, I mean, just by virtue of having this conversation, we've now uh, attributed uh, or or given other people reason to explore this subject even more, and and that will continue it continues to ripple. So when do you expect to hear, um, I guess, like some more advancements with like your with your case? I know you can't say like a ton of things, but I mean, I follow you, a bunch of people follow you and like we all just kind of want to know, like, are you do you think trial is going to happen soon? Do you think you might yes. be able to avoid it? And um, no, I want what's, trial. I what's want Mushi ha going to ha do? Here's where we're at. So uh, my lawyer has till this Friday to submit materials in response to Marineland who gave their materials for this new, call it, it's called a motion. And without going through all the details of it, it's just it's just quite literally another hoop to jump through. It's just mm -hmm. an expensive hoop. And, and uh, the good news is I've got for the most part the funding, so I'm not too concerned. It's just a matter of going through it. And then Marineland promised us one more uh, uh, thing they're trying to change. And I'm looking forward to working with my lawyer to crafting that update because too often the thing about litigation is much of the, um, within action stuff, uh, both parties are to assume a level of, um, of, of compliance, but, but compliance to the ethics that you don't reveal too much about it. It's these resolutions are meant to be done very quietly. See, I've, I've sort of grabbed this thing and tried to, to hype it up like a UFC event, right? I'm trying to make <laughs> a very boring thing exciting so i'm trying to get people hyped up for something it's, it's otherwise not exciting mm -hmm. but marine land is down to their last leg so so my guess is this time next week i assume to have uh, or, or in the next couple weeks because you know because of covid in-house attendances aren't happening but i do i do credit the judge with wanting to move matters forward enough that she is expediting this so we are having the matter heard uh, in writing which is the shame otherwise you know it's easier to get media attention when there's you can put cameras in the room but so the next you know in the next month i'll have lots to talk about in the next two months i'll have even more and then after that i'm hoping for a trial date my lawyer is confident that that marine line 
I mean, there's no way of knowing what they're going to pull. But again, because this is a straight up abusive process, nothing is beyond to be expected. There's mm-hmm. no way of knowing what they're going to do next. I can tell you what they're not going to do, provide evidence of anything that they've alleged of me because mm-hmm. it doesn't exist. And as far as Smooshy goes, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm keeping this as simple as possible. If she's still, if she's still alive, uh, let me see her. Mm-hmm. Immediately let me visit her and we'll stop all the litigation. We'll just end it. We'll, we'll pause it immediately. Let mm-hmm. me see her. And then thereafter, let's uh, see if we can negotiate uh, a mutual, uh, 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 you know, some, some, somewhere where we can send her. And if that exists, man, I'm walking away from this whole thing. You guys never see me again. You don't hear from me. You don't have to talk to me anymore. I'm just there to hug my walrus. And, 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 and you know, that's it. That, that's good enough for me. But I don't see that happening at that, it, like that. So I think what you're going to see is, is, a, is possibly a trial. And, uh, you know, I, again, because there's a lot of injustice in this, I do feel like there's, there's not enough scrutiny on the lawyer itself, himself. Okay. So I do want to see his song and dance in front of the judge when he tries to explain that his client was making him do these weirdo things the entirety of the time when in fact, maybe the client didn't. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested to see how this goes. I have a feeling it's going to go, it's going to have a few sharp turns on the way. Mm -hmm. I do too. So do you want to tell the listeners like where they can follow you about um, any way that they can support you websites, GoFundMe's, all that kind of stuff? Absolutely. So I'm on Twitter as Walrus Whisper. I'm on Instagram, Walrus Whisper. That one's two words. You can follow me as well, by the way. I noticed that you don't. I didn't, okay. Yeah, I didn't even look on Instagram. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. No judgment. You're a busy person. Um, you can go to, I know some people like to uh, help with my uh, my legal costs. So you can go to savesmooshy.com, which is S-A-V-E-S-M-O-O-S-H-I.com. And if you're a person who likes merch, I've got some shirts and whatnot. It's, it's, it's all dealt with through someone else, but go through uh, stealawalrus.com and you can get like a life is short, steal a walrus shirt, or you can get all the cool different things that they've, and they're adding stuff every day. I mean, these, these guys are doing a great job. I'm, I'm just, you know, in every which way that you want to, you want to credit me with all these significant change. I try to remind everyone that I stand on the shoulders of giants and that in every which way that I'm to be credited with any of the change that's happened, that there is no me without you. There is none. You know, I, I people, I, I, I have the opportunity to ask big money people for a single solitary check that would take care of all of my problems. I've never done it. I've always felt from day, granted day one, that wasn't any, but it is these days, but I've always felt that if you want sustained change, it's going to require more people than, than dollars. And so I tell people, I don't need a lot from you. I just need a lot of you. So, Mm -hmm. you know, shoot me a coffee's worth and, and tell a friend and, and, you know, we are creating the change. If you, if you like it then keep me going, keep me in this game. Yeah. I love it. I think you're doing a beautiful thing. I wish you luck. And, um, I'm going to keep my eyes on, on you. All right. Appreciate (laughs) that. It was a pleasure talking to you. You too. That's it for this week's episode. If you enjoyed the podcast, please rate and review and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. You can also share this podcast with a friend. It helps my podcast grow and I really appreciate it. I hope to see you next week.